continuing with uh, trying to get an understanding of the, the key ideas in economics that we're going to discuss a lot this semester. We're now going to talk about two mainstream macroeconomic views. This is something you maybe saw in your principles courses, maybe not. It depends on who you took. Okay, um, So we'll start with really the trickier one, which is classical economics. The overriding theme in macroeconomics is that uh, a lot of the, the basic ideas in macro, a lot of the, the primary things we would care about in macroeconomics, like what should the government do during a recession? There's no answer to that. There's no correct answer. There are schools of thought that tend to have different validity uh, based on the, the different structures that we have in that society, the way the government is set up, the way the economy is set up. So we'll start with one approach, which is classical economics. Okay, Classical economics is uh, focused basically on free market approaches. Okay, So this is where you've probably heard the term laissez-faire economics. Laissez-faire economics um, is connected to classical economics. Right? Laissez-faire basically just means hands off. So the idea of laissez-faire economics is the government should keep its hands off of the economy. Okay? Um, when you think about economists, a lot of times they seem to be more libertarian in nature. Generally, economists that are libertarian subscribe to classical economics. Okay? So classical economics, what we're trying to do is think about how the economy is operating, and they have their own structure of thinking about it. Okay, so we're going to try to derive that now in some detail, but not full detail. Okay, if this was macroeconomics right now, I'd be teaching you this. It would take like two hours. But for now, I'm just going to try to do it quickly so that we have the basic underpinning so we can uh, go to more advanced things. Okay, so in this market, all right, we have, first of all, the short run aggregate supply. And the short-run aggregate supply is uh, not too different from regular supply, all right? So when we think about a goods market, we think about supply, okay, supply and demand. Short-run aggregate supply, though, when we, when we think about these markets, we're no longer connecting price and quantity. Rather, we're thinking about it on a macroeconomic level, okay? So instead of putting quantity on this axis, we're not going to think about the quantity of a type of good, we're going to think about the quantity of all goods. And the best way to measure that is with real GDP, real gross domestic products. Okay, all of you should have seen this term before, but in case you haven't, GDP, gross domestic product, that's basically the total value of everything sold in a country in a year. So in the United States, our GDP is like $23 trillion. Okay, so we sell $23 trillion worth of stuff. We produce $23 trillion worth of stuff. Okay, that little R in front of it, real, that just means it's adjusted for inflation. Okay, again, that's a term that all of you should have seen. So this is adjusted for inflation, the value of everything we've produced in a year. Okay, so that would be our quantity. Instead of price, we're going to put CPI, Consumer Price Index. All right, CPI is a measure of prices. Generally speaking, prices go up over time. CPI will go up when there's inflation, okay? So instead of thinking of price and quantity for a good, we're thinking about the prices of everything and the production of everything, okay? In terms of our components in this graph, they're gonna have different relationships than they did in the, in the uh, previous example of supply and demand. Despite the fact that the connections are different and the explanation is different, you're still gonna see a similar uh, graph, which is, I guess, kind of convenient, okay? So short run aggregate supply, what it does is it think of, thinks about how does production in the short run change when CPI changes. All right, that, that's ultimately what it's trying to ask. And there's a lot of different ways to think about how uh, this would look in a literal sense, but what we believe it generally looks like is upward sloping. So short run aggregate supply would look something like that. Okay. Now, why would it look like that? Um, this is different from regular supply, right? Regular supply just says if prices go up, you sell more. This is a bit more complicated. Um, and there's a few different reasons of why we believe it looks like this. Uh, one reason is something called the sticky wage theory.
which basically says this, okay? When prices go up, when we have inflation and prices go up, think about wages, okay? If prices were to go up between today and tomorrow, do you think my wage would go up as well? Certainly not, right? My wage would not immediately adjust. Wages are slow to adjust. They're sticky, okay? Um, one major reason for that is contracts. I'm on a yearly contract, so there's no chance that my wage adjusts to any changes in the macroeconomy quickly, okay? So here's the thing. When CPI goes up, but wages stay the same, okay? When CPI goes up, but wages stay the same, think about what that means, all right? When CPI goes up, that means if you're a business, you can charge more for your goods. That's a good thing, right? And at the same time you're charging more for your goods, wages don't change. So the wages are stuck. That means that you can charge more for your good, but a lot of your costs are going to stay the same. So that means your profit margins are going to go up, all right? If I can charge 5% more for a good because CPI rises, but I'm continuing to pay my workers the same amount, my profit margin goes up. So profits go up, and anytime profits go up, businesses will respond by increasing production. Okay? So that is just one reason why we think we have this relationship between CPI and real GDP. So when CPI goes up, real GDP goes up. Okay? So that's one side of the market. So that was short run aggregate supply. We will talk about long run aggregate supply in a bit. But first, let's consider aggregate demand. All right, aggregate demand is basically thinking about how consumers adjust to changing prices. So if CPI changes, what happens to consumption? what this is trying to, to address, okay? We're going to use the same graph that we had before, right? The, the same parameters on our graph. So we've got real GDP and CPI. And all we're trying to think about is when CPI changes, how do consumers respond to that? And it turns out we think that it's downward sloping, quite similar to regular aggregate demand, or regular demand, right, that we saw with a, a goods market. Um, and the logic for this is not too different from demand, but the thing to recognize is when prices change, other things might change too. So when prices go down, you might be tempted to think, well, if prices go down, you buy more stuff. But one price that might also eventually go down is your wage. So if prices go down and your wage goes down, you could make an argument that it might not have a big effect. But the bottom line is this. When CPI goes down, any money that you already have has more buying power. So if you got $50,000 in the bank, even if your wage changed, that $50,000 in the bank now has more buying power. So you have more wealth, you spend more, okay? So when CPI goes down, real wealth adjusted, inflation adjusted wealth goes up, so spending goes up. All right, so that's why we believe aggregate demand looks like that. We can now tie the uh, two things we've seen together so far, aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply. We can connect these here, okay, like you see. And what we believe is most of the time this market operates pretty damn close to equilibrium, which just means All this means that equilibrium is production and consumption are equal, right? So if you have goods to sell, people will generally buy it. If you want to buy something, you can generally find something to buy. So equilibrium will normally happen, okay? So we've got most of our market here, but not all of our market are really an economy here that we're drawing. So the last component that we need is probably the most confusing, and it's called long-run aggregate supply.
All right, so th this is um, still really thinking about the same type of parameters. It's still thinking about CPI and real GDP. But now we're asking a, a slightly different question, okay? What we're asking now is if CPI changes, what will eventually happen to production? This is a weird thing, all right? This, this is one of those things that's very complicated if you've never seen it before. But when you're an, an economics major, and certainly when you're an economist, it eventually becomes second nature. It becomes just such an obvious thing when you deal with it a lot. And the effect is really just this. When anything happens, there are potentially two effects, a short run effect and a long run effect. Okay? So for example, let's say you're taking the exams, and the very first exam in this class, you get a 12. All right? Getting a 12 on your first exam will certainly have short run effects, right? The short run effects might be that you're sad, that you're mad, that you feel low self-esteem. There's all kinds of potential short run effects. You may drop the class or whatever. Now think about when you're 50 years old. Will that bad grade still be affecting you? Probably not, right? It probably won't have any impact. Chances are when you're 50, you can look back on that 12 and say it has no impact. In some cases, maybe for a few people in this class, it might have a profound impact, right? So some people will have very different long-run effects, okay? So when we think about stuff that happens in the economy, there are short-run and long-run effects, okay? This happens in our individual lives. It happens with the economy in general. Let me just give you one more metaphor, one more example. Uh, a couple years ago, I dropped a cutting board on my toe. I was making some guacamole, dropped it on my toe. It hurt my toe really, really badly, right? And these short-run effects were profound. I was in a lot of pain, all right? I couldn't walk, I couldn't run. I was in a lot of pain for the short run. Five months later, completely gone. So in that example, I had short run effects and no long run effects, okay? In other examples, you have both short run and long run effects. So we're basically just recognizing that there are two primary time horizons, the immediate effects that last for a while, and then this sort of steady state that we eventually reach, okay? So let's think about how that relates to what we're discussing here. Think about prices going up, okay? Think about if CPI right now went up 10%. If CPI just suddenly, right now, boom, were to go up 10%, 10% inflation overnight, would that affect the economy in the short run? Definitely, right? It definitely would have big short run effects, okay? Those short run effects would happen uh, for many reasons, but just to recall something we just discussed, remember the sticky wage discussion that we had. When prices go up or down, wages don't immediately adjust. So this is going to create some havoc in the market for labor and the market for goods in general. Okay, So if CPI goes up by 10%, but everyone's salary stays the same for a little while, there's going to be a period there where workers are underpaid relative to what they were before. Right? If I'm getting paid the same amount, but everything's getting 10% more expensive, my real wage goes down, all right? So there will be a short run effect and those will probably be very big. Now think about the long run effects. If prices go up 10% now, how will the economy be different eight years from now? Probably the economy won't be any different, all right? So effectively, although we have big short run effects, the long run effects really don't exist, right? In other words, when we, when we think about the inflation rates of 1992, the inflation rates of 1992 do not affect us anymore, right? They, they mattered then, they don't matter now. So they had short run effects, but no long run effects, okay? So what we're going to see next is the long run aggregate supply curve. And that's the last component of our model. And it's just vertical. The reason it's vertical is changes in CPI have no effect on long-run production. This is one of those crucial things you need to understand. First time you see it, sounds a little weird, but it becomes ingrained and it makes perfect sense, right? In the long run, prices don't affect anything. Let me give you an example. Imagine if we just decided right now we're going to add a zero to all of our, all of our currencies. Okay, so a penny is going to be worth 10 cents. 
a nickel 50 cents. A hundred dollar bill, we're gonna call it a thousand dollar bill. Think about how that would affect the economy. If you put that rule into place, immediately there would be some weird stuff happening, right? Things would be kind of chaotic. But the economy would adjust really quickly, right? If we just add a zero to all of our currency values, prices are also just gonna multiply by 10, right? If a dollar is suddenly worth $10, well, we're just gonna make anything that is normally a dollar, we're gonna change the price to $10. It's gonna adjust, right? Another example, if you go to Japan, their currency is not worth very much. So if you wanna buy a meal, it's a whole bunch of yen to buy a meal. But does that affect their economy? No, because you just get used to it. It doesn't matter how much anything costs. All that matters is the relative prices and how much currency there is in circulation. All right, so if CPI goes up or down right now, that will not affect our standard of living 20 years from now. Our standard of living is based on the quality of labor, the quality of capital, technology. It's based on those things, not prices. All right, so what this is telling us is changes in CPI, whether it be going up or going down, have no impact on the long run economy. So this graph, what it's telling us is not what is happening now, it's telling us what will eventually happen. And it's saying if CPI goes up, production eventually is not impacted whatsoever. So it remains the same here, okay? It's not really an equilibrium. All right, so that would be the long run real GDP. So that's a start. Next, we're gonna put these things together. Now that we have the general foundation down for classical economics, we can now start putting things together, right? We, we have the short-run aggregate supply curve, the aggregate demand curve, and the long-run aggregate supply curve. We can now think about these collectively, okay? For now, I'm gonna leave off that long-run aggregate supply curve. You're gonna see why it matters in a bit. Let's first just think about the short-run situation. So combining our two primary graphs here, the short-run aggregate supply curve and the aggregate demand curve, uh, we think that most of the time the economy operates pretty close to equilibrium here, which I'm just going to, from now on, symbolize with a Y just to give myself a bit more space. Uh, I think we mentioned this before, but you know the basic idea here is that an equilibrium is when everything that's produced is sold, and if you want to buy something, you can buy it, right? And that's basically where the economy is at at any given moment, okay? It means if you have something that people want, you'll be able to find somebody to buy it. And it means if you want to buy something, you can find something to buy, all right? So equilibrium should happen most of the time. Um, so let's think about a couple of different scenarios, all right? Let's first start with the one that we're generally the most focused on when we think about these, these mainstream economic beliefs. What if the economy is struggling? Okay, what if, what if there's a bad economy? If there's a bad economy, all right, th this is when we really care the most about macroeconomics is when things are bad, right? Um, so first of all, we gotta figure out how we're gonna define a bad economy. And most of the time we think about it in terms of the unemployment rates, okay? Unemployment rate's something you all should have seen in principles courses. The unemployment rate shows us the percent of the labor force that doesn't have a job, okay? So basically, think about all the people that want to work, all the people that are trying to work. What percent of those do not have a job, all right? Right now, in the U.S., you know, at the moment that I'm saying this, I think it's 6.7%, all right? So 6.7% of people that want to work don't have a job. We would call that a bad economy, right? We, we would call it something referred to as a recessionary gap which just means the economy is underperforming. So the, the basic way to think about it is if the unemployment rate is more than 4.5%, then we could call this situation to be a bad situation, all right, generally speaking. So here's what the classical economists believe will happen, okay? When the unemployment rate is 4.5%, they believe this is going to push some things into motion, all right? The economy has a way of fixing itself no one has to guide the economy. Hands off, laissez-faire, right? So when the unemployment rate is 4.5%, this is what they believe will happen. Given the high unemployment, wages will go down, all right? That's the first little step that occurs. 
So basically when anything, there's a little bit of out of whack in the economy, you're going to see these results begin to occur. And, and this is going to be a common theme in this course. When any, whenever, anytime there's something out of whack in, in economics, it has a way of cleansing itself. It has a way of, of causing a chain reaction of events to occur. I sometimes liken this to thinking about the animal world. All right, so let's think about literally animals. If we suddenly released 10 million moths into the atmosphere, into the earth, think about what that would do, right? You wouldn't just end up with more moths forever. It would cause a chain reaction of events. For example, bats. Bats would do very well when there's lots of moths. So they would survive and they would procreate and there would end up being more bats. And as those bats began to grow in population, they would consume more and more of those moths, right? So if you do something, if you see a change in the economy, it's going to create a bunch of events, okay? I hope you don't mind that kind of silly analogy, but it really isn't that dissimilar. When anything's out of whack, it has a way of cleansing itself, right? So when wages go down, think about what would occur as a result. If you're a business, if you're running a business, all right, and, and if I'm running a business and I see that wages are going down in the economy, ceteris paribus, that's going to cause me to hire more labor, okay? So businesses hire more labor because they're cheaper. Okay? So, you, you, again, you, you see some things begin to result from this, and you can probably see where we're going for, with this now, right? We start out with a bad economy, and now we're hiring more labor, right? That's going to help fix this economy, okay? So with more labor, you also get more production. And effectively, we fix the problem, okay? The problem that we've had to begin with, high unemployment, a bad economy, low production, we've effectively fixed that now, okay? And the way the classical economists would believe this would resolve itself is through a shift in the aggregate supply curve, okay? We're going to explain why it's aggregate supply and not aggregate demand in just a bit. But basically, think about it here. These are production issues, okay? We're not even talking about consumers. Just from a production standpoint, when unemployment rates are high, it will cause things to occur that allow more production, so the short run aggregate supply curve would shift right and we would reach a new equilibrium level of real GDP. All right? If you ever wondered why do we have this idea that the economy would fix itself, there it is. Okay. There is another possibility. So if we think about the economy, there's really uh, three possibilities here. One, you could have a recessionary gap. And that just means that the economy is weak, the economy is underperforming, and that means that the unemployment rate will be more than 4.5%, okay? There's also the possibility that the economy can actually be overperforming call this an inflationary gap okay and normally we uh, we use that same threshold of four and a half percent it it's not a steadfast perfect value that we use all the time but four and a half percent seems to be in the range of uh, of reality okay um, so an inflationary gap would just mean the unemployment rate is more than four and a half percent I'm sorry less than four and a half percent okay so with an unemployment rate less than 4.5%, you know, that basically means the economy is performing too well. A little bit of unemployment is good. You know? Just like having a, a few students get Fs is good for a class, uh, this is a good thing too. Okay, Because if the unemployment rate is 0%, you might not have as much incentive to try to build your skills. If the unemployment rate is 0%, you're probably not having a lot of technology, new changes in the economy, right? Think about major events that help economic growth. Something like the invention of a car, right? The invention of vehicles created a ton of unemployment, okay? When we have self-driving cars, that is going to help the economy a lot, but there will be a ton of unemployment that results from that. So having some unemployment is natural. In fact, we call it natural unemployment. It should occur. So anytime that unemployment rate gets 
below four and a half, you know, maybe below four percent, three and a half percent. When it's starting to get down in that low range, we actually start to worry about it. Okay, so that's called an inflationary gap. Inflationary gaps can be very problematic because when the economy is really, really, really strong, um, it often leads to failure. It often leads to people making investments that aren't going to work out. You know, when the economy looks like this, you start a business, the business is going to do well. But the problem is you might be starting a business not because your business is a good idea, but you might be starting a business just because the economy is so good. So if you start a business in this environment, it will succeed. But eventually, when the economy goes back to normal, you'll fail. And you'll be in a worse situation than you were before because now you've taken on a bunch of debt to try to start a business. Okay, So both of these are bad All right, in, in the classical way of thinking. And then there's also a third possibility we call the long run equilibrium. And this just means basically the, un the unemployment rate is at its ideal level, okay? Right around four and a half percent. So, you know, again, I'm using these numbers here. They're, they're not perfect numbers. If the economy, if we have 5.2% unemployment or 3.9% unemployment, we're not gonna worry about that too much. We would still say we're pretty much at the long run equilibrium. But the basic thing to recognize here is there is such thing as too high of unemployment, but also there's something that's too low. Unemployment can be too low. And there's a sweet spot that we like. We call that the long run equilibrium, all right? Now think about how the economy actually works. Most of the time, where is our unemployment rate in the United States? You know, if you had to think about these three categories, most of the time, the long run equilibrium is actually where we are, right? The unemployment rate tends to be pretty close to four and a half percent most of the time. You know, thinking about the last four or five years, we were around three and a half to four percent most of the time. Okay, if you go back and you just pick a random decade, you're going to see the unemployment rate close to four and a half percent most of the time. That's because the economy has a way of pushing itself back towards that unemployment rate. We saw that with a recessionary gap. Now let's look at it in terms of an inflationary gap. So the same type of graph we had before. Let's imagine in this scenario, the economy is overperforming. All right, so this is gonna be our inflationary gap. So let's imagine that this economy right here is overperforming. And I want you guys to have this answer quick in your head. When we think about the strength of the economy, Think about the unemployment rate. That's the easiest way to think about how the economy is performing. All right. So if we're in an inflationary gap, how do we know that? We know it because the unemployment rate is too low. Right. It's hard to think about what the GDP should be. It's hard to know what's happening to the GDP over time. So the unemployment rate tends to be our best signal for thinking about how the, the economy is operating. So in this case, the unemployment rate is less than four and a half percent. So let's kind of do what we did with the recessionary gap. You know, if you're watching this video, go back and rewind and look at these steps we took for the recessionary gap. That will help you understand this, okay? So with the inflationary gap, all right, we're basically just going to go in a similar but reverse order, all right? In this case, we have very few people unemployed. So what's going to happen to wages when it's hard to find a worker? If it's hard to find a worker, you're going to have to pay them more, right? So wages tend to go up, right? So that would be the first step here. With low unemployment, wages go up. It's a supply and demand issue, right? Workers are scarce, so they demand more pay, right? So wages go up. As wages go up, businesses hire fewer workers. Businesses hire fewer workers. With fewer workers means less production. So just like a recessionary gap had a way of fixing itself, an inflationary gap has a way of fixing itself as well. And so lastly, just to think about what this would look like, the less production is manifested by a decrease, a leftward shift in that short run aggregate supply curve. Okay, so the end result is the real GDP goes down, CPI goes up, okay?
So this is the way the classical economists viewed everything. And maybe, maybe you went through this in your macro course, maybe you didn't. Either way, you need to know what classical economics is, okay? Classical economics, in a nutshell, is the belief that the economy can fix itself, laissez-faire economics. Now you see the argument. Now you see the mechanism by which it works, okay? So let's now put the last component in, and we can be pretty much done with classical economics for now. There's one component that we need to include, and that is that long-run aggregate supply curve. And we will now see why that long-run aggregate supply curve is meaningful. So at any given moment in an economy, you can kind of imagine that we're in some sort of short-run equilibrium, okay? It might be in a recessionary gap, it might be in an inflationary gap, who knows. But the economy is operating at some level. Okay? Now we can add in that long-run aggregate supply curve. The thing about the long-run aggregate supply curve is, at any given moment, it doesn't really exist. Okay? The long-run aggregate supply curve is not something that we can really think about in a tangible way. Rather, it's an idea about where the economy is going to go, okay? So as a thought exercise, ask yourself this. In 2028, what do you think the unemployment rate will be? The best guess is about 4.5%, all right? Because the economy has a self-cleansing mechanism. It's unlikely the unemployment rate will be really high because it has a way of pushing itself back. It's unlikely the unemployment rate will be really low because it has a way of keeping unemployment rate, again, close to 4.5%. So what the long-run aggregate supply curve shows us is the economy at its maximum potential, which I'm just going to put max, or, um, I'm going to put max here in terms of the maximum sustainable potential. Okay? It shows us what the economy should be if the unemployment rate is 4.5%, okay, that's what it's telling us. If the unemployment rate is 4.5%, this is our level of production that we should expect, okay? So in this economy, do you think this economy is underperforming or overperforming? It's underperforming, right? It's underperforming because the real GDP that's occurring in this economy is below it's maximum sustainable potential, all right? We call this a natural real GDP. That's not a term you need to know, but if you've ever heard that before, that's what we're referring to here, okay? So what would happen? Recessionary gap, all right? A recessionary gap means the economy is underperforming, so there's gonna be a lot of available workers. Businesses will hire workers as their labor costs go down, right? When there's a lot of workers available, wages go down. So businesses will hire more workers, and production will start to creep up. So we'll see the short run aggregate supply curve begin to shift to the right, right? It's gonna to continue to do so until it reaches a long run equilibrium. It will continue to do so until it reaches that point right there. You see, the thing about that point right there is, what's the unemployment rate if we're at our maximum sustainable potential? Four and a half percent. So the economy is going to keep calibrating until it reaches that 4.5% unemployment rate. That's what makes it an equilibrium, okay? It's going to keep calibrating until we reach that point. So the classical economists believe that this long-run aggregate supply curve is very important because it shows us where our economy is heading at any given moment.